I can't even begin to imagine the kinds of things that those of you who participated in the experience just now were, were writing down on those slips of paper and, and putting in that bowl that represents God's hands. I, I can't even begin to imagine some of the anxieties and cares that many of us are dealing with these days as our reality on the ground, as the situation changes in a weekly and, and even on a daily basis, the ground under our feet feels like it's shifting and the world is changing and it feels like it's spinning out of control. And the question for last week was, how are we going to live as followers of Jesus and as a church in response to COVID-19 as an entity in and of itself? The question for this morning is, how do we live as individuals in the midst of the anxieties that swirl around these uncertain moments? As I've been thinking about um, this morning... The text that kept coming to mind is actually a text that we taught through about a year ago. In James chapter 4, starting in verse 13, it says this. James is speaking to wealthy, privileged people like many of us. And he says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He says, listen, those of you who have privilege enough to be in control of your time and, in, and your travel and your treasures, your finances, your business, your profits, he says, we live with this mindset where we just make future plans assuming that we're fully in control of how our lives are going to unfold. But he goes on to say this, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. James says, you're making plans for a year from now when you are not even control of what will happen tomorrow. It's interesting we taught this text a year ago because nobody could have predicted a year from now that we would be doing online services in a virtual lockdown because of a global pandemic. Never mind, no one could have predicted two weeks ago that a million Canadians would have applied for unemployment benefits this last week alone because of how quickly our reality is changing. James says, you're not in control of what's going to happen from one day to the next. He says, think about your life. It's fleeting and fragile. He said, it's like a drop of dew that appears on a blade of grass in the morning and it evaporates before noon. It's just gone. I'm going to tell you, we... In our home, married as I am to a frontline healthcare worker fighting COVID-19 who has a history of respiratory illness herself, um, we don't think it's likely, but we're having lots of sober end-of-life conversations about what happens in the off chance if. These are real concerns. These are the kinds of things that create anxiety when everything feels like it's out of our control and everything seems uncertain in the moment. And no wonder for many of us, anxiety is building in our experience of these days. And yet, here's the thing that I want to say about what it means to live in the midst of these moments without, to live unanxiously. Uh, Part of what it's going to take is actually coming to terms with the reality in which we live. I think one of the things that's happening right now for most of us, if not all of us, is that we are being disillusioned of an illusion that we have lived with, that our lives are within our control. We have pretended because of our privilege, because of the number of things we can control, that we are in control of our lives. And the truth is we never have been. And only now are we starting to realize that our lives are not in our control, but our lives are in control of us. And actually, I was talking to a counselor friend of mine who said to me this week, learning to live unanxiously in part is about coming to terms with the reality that that's just how our life is. She called it radical acceptance. That instead of living in the coulda, shoulda, woulda of the way I wish my life was, to accept, they say in AA, to take life on life's terms, to accept that this is the way that life is 
and to learn to live within it. She was telling me about a study that was done comparing suburban women in America with Kenyan women in terms of their relative levels of anxiety. And she said there was absolutely no comparison. Suburban women in America had anxiety that was off the charts, as many of us who are not suburban women also do, have anxiety off the charts compared to Kenyan women. And the study said the reason that that's true is that North American people live with this illusion that we're in control of our lives, and so we have certain expectations of how our lives are going to turn out, and that comes with a a level of anxiety of what happens if it doesn't turn out that way, where, by contrast, Kenyan women who just take life on life's terms and who say, this is the hand life dealt me, and this is the hand I'm going to play, What they do instead of getting anxious and hoping for certain outcomes is they band together in community and solidarity with each other and say, how can we deal with life the way that it is together? And they live with way lower levels of anxiety. There's a part of learning to live unanxiously that just has to do with the radical acceptance of this is the way that life is, which is actually one of the things that James says, but he focuses on a very particular part of reality that we need to come to radically accept. He says, instead of thinking you're in control of your lives, he says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. He says, you have to learn to live your life within the reality that while you are not in control over your circumstance, God is sovereign over everything that's happening. Now, I want you to hear that I switched words on you. I did not say that God is in control of everything that's happening. God is not controlling a global pandemic. Anyone who says God sent the pandemic to teach us this or God sent the pandemic to judge us for that, God did not send this pandemic. God is a God of life, not a God of death. The pandemic is not God's will. God is not in control of the pandemic, but God is sovereign over the pandemic, which is to say that the pandemic and the financial implications do not inhibit God in the least in God's ability to execute God's loving, saving purposes in the world. God is still doing the good thing that God does in the world in spite of the transformed circumstances. The James says you can come to live with the reality the way that it is, knowing that it is God that's sovereign over it, and you're just living within the sovereignty of God over the circumstances. You can trust God because of the kind of God that is in sovereign uh, over everything that's happening. This is the kind of God that God is. In Hebrews 13, a a letter that was written um, to uh, a church that was facing persecution and trouble, the writer of the Hebrews says, this is the kind of God that God is. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God is with you in the midst of your changing circumstances every bit as much as God has been with you in whatever past God-filled circumstances you've celebrated in your life, and God will be with you in whatever future circumstances you're moving into in exactly the same way that God is with you today because God's presence to you and for you and with you in the midst of what you're living through right now has never and will never change. God is with you in the midst of this. And who is the God that is with you? Three verses later, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God who is with you in the midst of your circumstances is the God that we see in Jesus Christ, who is the God that always acts exactly the same way. We talked about this last week who enters into your reality to lean in, in love, and act life-givingly and savingly to rescue you from the impact of death. No wonder the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 to a church again facing persecution and trouble and famine and whatever. He says, what shall we say in response to these things? Here's what we'll say. If God is for us, Who can be against us? With that kind of God in our corner, 
with us, acting life-givingly and lovingly and savingly, sovereign over everything and able to bring his good purposes into our lives, no matter the circumstances on the ground. No wonder if that is the God who is with us, then what could possibly stand in our way? No wonder the most common command repeated in the Bible is, do not be afraid. So if we're going to live our lives not being afraid, how are we going to live? I want to say two things, both of them from Jesus, both of them from Matthew chapter 6. The first way that we're going to live is that we're going to live without worry. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I was thinking this last week that in the midst of these exact moments, the financial instability, the fear of a global pandemic, the, the future as uncertain as it is, we have probably never been more able to understand what a first century person in Israel lived with every moment of every day, 24-7 for the entire duration of their lives. These fears that we're living with in these days were the fears that they lived with always. And what did Jesus speak into their lives? Do not worry. Now, Jesus isn't commanding them how to feel. You can't command your feelings. And honestly, in the midst of a global pandemic, it is not irrational to feel some fear. What, Jesus, what you can command are your choices, your behaviors. Jesus is commanding them to not indulge the kind of behaviors that um, exacerbate emotional and psychological anxiety in a way that is disruptive to life. That's what worry means, emotional and psychological anxiety that is disruptive to life. Jesus says, do not indulge the behaviors that make the anxiety worse. I was talking to a different counselor friend this week, and I said, what does that mean? And she said, it means two things. It means, number one, Stop focusing so much attention and energy on things you cannot control. You cannot control somebody else's behavior. You cannot control whether or not somebody else is social distancing appropriately. You cannot control the way another person behaves on social media. You cannot control if another person is judging uh, somebody's pandemic behavior because it is too extreme or because it is not extreme enough. You can't control the stock market. You can't control your employment. You can't control the global spread of a pandemic. You can't control ICUs in New York City. Um, there are so many things that we cannot control that we need to stop pouring energy and attention into being anxious about those things. We need to get away from social media, turn off the news, limit our exposure, figure out how to redirect our attention away from the things we cannot control to the things we can control. This is the other thing she said. You can control you. You can control your behavior. Are you behaving in a way that's stopping the spread of the pandemic? Are you behaving in a way that's keeping you safe and the people you love safe, whether they live with you or whether they are apart from you? You can control how you behave on social media. You can control what you do with your minutes each day. My, um, my one friend said that depression is about living in the past, anxiety is about living in the future, and to some degree, part of the solution to both is about living in the present. What is needed from you right now? Are you staying at home with people you care about? What do they need from you right now? Um, do they need you to make lunch? Do they need you to tidy the house? If you're living in an unstructured stay-at-home reality that gives lots of space for anxiety to flourish, structure your reality like it's a job. I'll, I'll get up and first thing in the morning, I'll do my chores and I'll work out. And then I'm going to spend some time reading the Bible and praying. And then I'm going to make lunch. And then I'm going to go for a walk. And then I'm going to watch a movie. And then I'm going to make supper. And then I'm going to play a game. Structure your day so that you have something productive to focus on in the moment, every moment of every day. When it gets bad, recenter yourself in the moment. Sit down, put your feet on the floor, put your hands on your knees, close your eyes, 
and take a deep breath for three or four seconds and hold it for three or four seconds and then exhale for three or four seconds and hold it for three or four seconds and do that for two minutes. Just let your breath bring you back to the moment, bring you back to the present, bring you back to center and then go back to focusing on the things you can control. That's the first thing. Jesus says we're not going to indulge the behaviors that contribute to anxiety. We're going to focus away from the things we can't control, and we're going to focus on the things we can control. Here's the second thing he says. So don't worry. At the end of the passage, he says in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He says, instead of focusing on things that create anxiety, we're going to focus, we're going to seek, pursue, we're going to lean into God's kingdom. What is God's kingdom? It's what life is like when God is allowed to have God's way. We're going to lean into the things that create peace and hope and life and joy and flourishing and well-being. We're going to nurture those things in our reality. It says lean into, pursue God's kingdom and God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? It's it's relationships behaving rightly, which is to say relationships behaving in love. We're going to devote our attention to leaning into loving God and to loving ourselves and to loving each other and to loving our world and to even loving the planet. What does that look like? Well, we've talked, I think, about loving ourselves, at least in terms of um, how anxiety happens. We're going to love ourselves by trusting God who is sovereign over everything. We're going to love ourselves by not focusing on things we can't control, but focusing on things we can control. How are we going to love God? Well, what about things like doing what we've done in this service already? Um, Spending time in scripture, in the book of Acts, reflecting on what it means to be a follower of Christ and the church in moments like this. What about praying the Lord's Prayer? It's interesting to me that just before Jesus says, don't worry, but seek the kingdom, he teaches his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is to ask for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done and for God to provide what we need and protect our relationships and spare us from trouble and trial. What an appropriate way to lean into loving trust for God. The early Christians used to pray that prayer three times a day. What if we reclaimed that practice? What would it look like for us to love each other in this moment? Who needs us right now to be a source of life and hope and laughter and joy? Who can we lift up right now? How does the world need us to love them right now? We talked about it last week. The best way that you can love the world right now is by focusing on doing the five. Wash your hands. Uh, sneeze and cough into your elbow. Don't touch your face. If you have to leave your house, observe social distancing. But for God's sake, don't leave your house if you don't have to. The best way for us to love the world is to stop the spread of the disease. Friends, I think this is a moment where in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of this realization that we are not in control. This can be a moment where we learn how to unanxiously trust the God who loves and acts lovingly and savingly and life-givingly for us every moment of every day. Let's lean into trust in these times of uncertainty. Let me pray a prayer for us, one that may be you will recognize if you're in AA, you've heard it before, the prayer, the serenity prayer. Um, But let me pray it because I think this is what God is inviting us into. Let's pray together. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.